remember, DAML stands for Data Analytics and Machine Learning. Uh, for those of you for whom it's their first time in Seattle DAML, raise your hand. Awesome, love that. Veterans, raise your hand. Fantastic. I'm not quite sure that's sum to one, but that's okay. Uh, <laughs> Tonight we have two fantastic uh, talks, and, and Lee is get one of my co-organizers of DAML is going to come up and introduce the speakers. But first off, I wanted to say we have another event at Google in Kirkland on the 20th of October, which is a Thursday, not a Tuesday. And we also have a November 17th event at AI2, which is the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence, uh, AI, AI. And uh, that's at AI2 on 17th of November, and so we've got two months of meetups ready to go, so RSVP on meetup and Eventbrite, uh, and I will let everyone get settled down. Find some seats, all of you who are standing, uh, grab some food too. There are some open seats in the front, don't be shy, uh, open seats in the middle too. Get to know your neighbor, that's how we build community, so once again, enjoy, and uh, let me know if you have any questions after meetup, thanks. And here's the intrepid. What's happening? What's happening, Gary? What's happening? Please get Just stand here so it's completely awkward while I introduce you. Hi, everybody. How's everyone doing? All right. Don't get any more woohoos like the ones at Daml. Very cool. Um, nice to see you all. Bridging in, this is your first time ever at Galvanize. All right, thank you so much, Daml, for recruiting some more people into our cult. We'd love to see it, yes. Uh, for the uninitiated, no, Galvanize is not a code, but cult or whatever, but um, my name is Lee, and I'm the evangelist here at Galvanize. We are a learning community for technology, so we focus on education, especially in data science, which is very relevant to you all here. Uh, we are also a workspace for freelancer startups and enterprises, and we also are a networking uh, space as well for, as you can see, like 100 billion events that happen at the same time. So never a dull moment around here. There's always something going on. And uh, we've been hosting demos like for a good year now, and it's always been just this kind of huge, huge crowd. Um, first of all, where were all of you during the summer? It seems like uh, everyone decided to go outside, have some vacations, <laughs> but now you're on September, so now, okay, we're just gonna show up and be internal for the next six months, and awesome, awesome. So anyways, if anyone has any questions or any um, interest in like learning more about what we do here, please come talk to me or find anybody with a galvanized shirt around here. Uh, but without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, and I'm totally doing this from memory and not reading this off the meetup page. Um, our first speaker <laughs> is from Microsoft, and he will talk a lot about uh, learning how to do a lot of analysis from billions of events using counts and sketches. So please give it up for Misha Belenko. So the algorithm is called Distributed Robust Algorithm for Account-Based Learning. Uh, it's uh, worked with a bunch of people. Uh, in my MSR days, it was uh, Chris Meek, then Pete and Wenham, and then Ashwell and Christian, uh, and I worked on this really nice uh, time uh, extension of it that I'll cover also. Uh, and seriously, this also spells Dracula, uh, because he likes to count. Um, so, okay, so intro, this is fairly basic, so it used to be the case that machine learning uh, would draw those curves on how much data helps you, it sort of usually peters out. Uh, what we learned in the past 10, 15 years is that, well, it never peters out as long as you're able to utilize more data, as long as there's more signal. Uh, obviously, all the latest uh, hype around events uh, made us even more convinced that if we just throw enough cycles uh, and enough tricks at it, we can do good stuff with more data. So <clears throat> I will not talk about going through lots and lots of examples. There's a lot of activity around that everywhere else. Uh, the interesting side problem of having lots of data is that a lot of the time when you have lots and lots of examples, you also have lots and lots of different attribute values. Um, what that means, uh, how many of you are familiar with the Criteo benchmark? It was, okay, so I'll describe it quickly. It's a pretty popular in Gaggle circles. Benchmark uh, that first was a 10 GB data set. 
Uh, and then they released a one terabyte data set. Uh, the nice thing about it is that it's real. Uh, it's actually your tail is a data company. Uh, the data set is clips and not clips, described by the mysterious uh, 13 attributes and, uh, that are numeric. But more importantly, 26 attributes that are hashes of actual queries, IPs, user IDs, whatever Curtail actually uses to make lots of money. Uh, if you're in any of the companies that have large ad engines, uh, that's a pretty bread and butter task for much of the ad pipeline. You basically have attributes of the user coming in, uh, of the context, like the page they're looking at, the query they issued, and you need to estimate the click probability for a given ad, which again has things like text of the ad, side of the ad. And so, the, what are the attributes in this case? So the user side, there's attributes like the user ID, uh, user cookie, uh, any demographics you can see. Demographics obviously are pretty low dimensional, there's only so many values. As soon as we go to IPs or IDs, things explode like crazy. Um, so and that's what this graph shows is that, well, here is a, you know, one terabyte is about a month of data, and the number of actually unique values we're seeing keeps growing and growing and growing. Uh, for some of the reasons that are obvious, people churn their cookies, uh, new people come in, old ads go away, new ads come in. But that's a pretty common case, not just for ads, but for most real life systems where you have data continuously churning, uh, whether it's on the user side, on the supply side of the data. So the hard part here is that, well, if you just think of it, if you're an R person, uh, you say, okay, it's a factor variable, but the factor with, you know, a billion values is not really good for R, uh, and not, not for much else actually. So, um, so kind of this is the setup. Uh, so suppose uh, you are in, you know, in, in ads, uh, you have a user. User has properties like the, like IDs, IDs. Uh, on the supply side, the ads also have properties like IDs. They also have text, uh, and usually people look at content uh, in context. Uh, again, if you don't like ads, think of just for defenders. Uh, context is usually also could be the previous page they looked at, which can be very useful. So you always have a bunch of these things which are either text or categorical, and it's pretty easy looking. Um, and the challenge is that for most cases, these get really big as the site gets popular or the service gets popular. So you're easily into this millions and billions territory uh, in terms of the actual number of possible values that you see. So that's obviously hard, uh, so, and it's very common. So just to outline like the areas where this happens, uh, so information retrieval here includes ads, recommending search. You always have this notion of transactions between users and items in some context, and all of them have these sort of properties, uh, which have many values. But in general, anything that's transactional, uh, so fraud, uh, for example, you still have this notion of, uh, you know, parties, the parties have properties or IDs. Uh, in things like spam and services. So in web services, you still have content, content has properties. Anytime you have many, basically, actors, you will have many, many IDs just because, uh, and intrusion detection uh, networking and so on. So the setup is, is hopefully very common to many of you working on any domain that you're dealing with. So the real problem is that, okay, how do we turn this into features? So for most normal ML algorithms, you at the end of the day want to end up with some vector. Uh, sometimes it's okay if it's very sparse, sometimes you don't want it to be sparse, but you still want a vector, you still want the vector to be not billion dimensional most of the time. Uh, and so there are certain properties you want in that mapping going from these attributes that are strings or IDs to those numbers. So ideally you want that mapping to handle the fact that you'll have billions of possible values. Uh, you want that mapping to be fairly easy to compute, especially if many of these real-time systems, you will have to be doing it in fairly few milliseconds at a huge volume. Uh, you want it to also be flexible because a lot of the time mapping is one thing, but what you really are doing is doing some machine learning downstream, uh, which will be consuming those vectors. And you know, if you're a data scientist, you will be playing with different pieces downstream, so you don't want to commit to something that will basically uh, leave you with few choices. Uh, and then also a lot of the domains have the case that these things change very rapidly, so ideally that mapping should be something that can easily withstand the fact that they, you know, the ID, some IDs will, you'll see them once or twice and they'll never come back. Uh, and other IDs will keep appearing over and over. So these are kind of the core properties that would be nice of any sort of mapping scheme. And so we'll cover a couple of very standard textbook approaches for doing this, and then we'll cover the strict, which is actually pretty simple, uh, but works really well. 
Uh, and so, that, so that's the first three are done by kind of every toolkit out there. And then what we've seen now with most large ad engines is this variance of this learning to counts trick uh, that I'll cover today. So, okay. So first of all, uh, the normal one hot thing. So the first thing you can imagine doing is basically assigning uh, each ID uh, slot in your vector. Uh, you have uh, so for user ID, you have a set of slots. For uh, add add IDs, you have slots. For say caches of queries, you have slots. And so that becomes your big white vector. Uh, so when any you know specific value comes in, you calculate whatever the slot ID is. And there, you now have your sparse vector, where there's just a few ones corresponding to whatever the slots for those values are. Um, the, so that's very simple. Uh, it's known as like one hot uh, indicator. Where, like, every ML system out there has it. So the challenge is that now you have to keep track of you know what's the slot number for that ID or for that ID or for that string. Um, so in that brings all sorts of issues uh, for large scale systems. So it doesn't really scale because now, you know, once you're out, like, there's only so many slots you can assign. Uh, it's not really efficient because now you have giant dictionaries uh, you have to keep track of. Uh, it's not flexible because if you have very large dimensional vectors, you only can use the linear learners realistically. Uh, you can't really stick it into trees or nets. Um, and finally, like once you assign these slots, it's kind of a pain to think of, OK, if a certain ID doesn't show up again, do I just recycle that slot somehow and then assign it to somebody else? So that's just a thing. So uh, feature hashing uh, is a very kind of nice riff on this that makes this uh, immediately much more usable. Uh, so under its current name, feature hashing, it was introduced by some folks around uh, 08 or 09, uh, or at Yahoo at the time. Um, if you track that, actually, the first time well, it's found in literature was in 89 MIPS when uh, some folks were trying to train uh, the really hot technology of the time, known as neural networks. Uh, and they had this problem of trying to fit, I think, 60, with 16,000 features, uh, which was crazy. Uh, and that's why they uh, jointly came up with hacking. Uh, and then it was reinvented over and over. Uh, but the trick is very simple. Then instead of like pre-assigning those values, you just compute a hash function, which you can do of a string of anything, and that gives you the slot ID. Uh, and so then the nice thing is that you no longer need to worry about having separate feature vector for you know your user or your for this value or this value. You just hack, you just hash everything into one big vector. Uh, you make it collisions. But yeah, there will be rare if your vector is big enough. Uh, and so, and then actually, the nice thing about the kind of the most recent spurt of that work in Yahoo was that uh, there was a result which shows actually why it's not as bad uh, because if you and the, the, if you basically hash with a little plus minus sign flip, uh, you get unbiased kernel values. But actually, it doesn't really matter. Like every every implementation I've seen doesn't even do that, and it's still okay. Uh, so the nice thing is it's obviously scalable, uh, so you don't need to keep track of you know what's the index for a certain string or ID or anything. Uh, it's really efficient because now uh, everyone by default uses Murmur free hash, uh, which you can you know fix on Wikipedia. It's a very nice uh, hashing algorithm. It's still not really flexible because you stick basically to prevent collisions. We will still have collisions, but obviously you don't want too many collisions. Uh, so realistically, you are looking at hundreds of thousands and above number of features. Uh, which again rules out nonlinear learners out there. Um, and then in terms of activity, it's okay, but it doesn't really let you capture the fact that well, how many times did I see you know this IP in the last day or something? So that gets tricky. Uh, you can this by plus minus. You can start kind of running on that trick by hashing it together with a timestamp. Uh, more on that later. Okay, so what you can do instead uh, is a kind of weird hybrid of the two. Uh, so and I'll talk about why it's actually a really good idea for more reasons than just being efficient and all that. So think of having a table uh, where each of these properties, where you're going to start memorizing uh, how many times you've seen uh, clicks or non clicks uh, for each user, for each app, for a combination of user app. So that's a uh, it sounds a little scary because we just said about how we can't really scale to all this. So, and that's why the escape patch is that we're not going to memorize it for actually everything. We're going to memorize it up to as much as we think is okay. Uh, and then beyond that, we're going to have this, this kind of what's known as uh, rest bin or garbage bin or backup bin, uh, which for basically rare stuff, we're just not going to worry and just pile it up. Um, if you don't 
done work in like natural language learning, for example, the notion of backup models, shrinkage, it's the same idea. That basically you can, you know, you can, you can have these hierarchies of things you remember and then kind of more coarse uh, layers where you're just backing up to uh, more broad countries. And so what you can do then, so if you're into Bayesian stuff, you can think of it as a conditional probability table. Because uh, all you're just memorizing is just the frequencies that are conditional for each class label. Uh, so the two columns here is, they know, in this case, again, in the add example, you're just memorizing for each IP how many times you've seen that IP click and not click. If you have a multi-class problem, you'll have the number of classes columns. If you have a regression problem, you can just binarize it uh, your favorite, using your favorite method and then just still basically discretize distribution. It's still a conditional probability table. Uh, that's the way to think of it. Um, so then now what you can do is that you can have this table for different things that you're observing. And then you can now stick them into this vector uh, where each of the tables produces four values. Uh, so you can basically look up for a given property how many times you've seen it for the positive class, how many times you've seen it for the negative class. So that's the raw CPT values. You can also compute uh, what's known as log odds, which is nicely computable really fast as log n plus minus log n minus, but that's actually the same as probability of click divided by probability of non-click. Uh, this is the algebra of it working out. And then you can also send a little wink if it actually was not a real value, but it came from the reference that I've So this way, you're basically preserving whether you're, like, say, in the case of IP of query, like, is it really big numbers here because actually it's something that you've seen a bunch of times. It's like if it's queries, it's your you know, Facebook query from the very head. Or you just have no idea where it is, and it's really from the back. So it allows you to basically discriminate between those two cases, which is pretty important. Because in one case, you have very high confidence in terms of what that probability is. In the other case, it's just a bunch of the generic file, and you probably shouldn't look at this, you know, this property of it, but look at the other property. <laughs> so that's so the log odds is that this is also if you're going to do to base stuff, you can think of it as nice base estimate just based on this one feature, because effectively you're just looking at the kind of the, the log space. Uh, value of that one feature's prediction for whether, you know, how likely that is going to be put going forward. Uh, the counts are themselves sometimes indicative because, especially their difference obviously is important, but it's already captured, but the counts themselves effectively tell you how many times have you seen this uh, and how many clicks are you basing this on or not clicks. Uh, and so, like I said, that then the rest is telling you whether it's garbage or that's off or name. So, of course, uh, since I'm promoting this uh, or you know, recommending it, it's all going to be green and great and all that. Uh, but I really think it is. But the reason why it's popular uh, in lots of these ad platforms is because it does allow you to basically trade off between keeping the, you know, the, the stuff that you know a lot about in memory and actually just doing a lookup uh, against the stuff that you don't see a lot, just keeping it all compressed. Uh, and so that's pretty nicely scalable in the sense that if you have however much RAM you have for these tables or however much you want to pay for, you know, the value of a uh, store, you can do that uh, at your discretion. Uh, it's efficient because it's pretty low cost in terms of runtime. You're just doing a couple of lookups uh, and then sticking it into the vector. Uh, dimensionality is really the biggest benefit here because now you're not dealing with this gazillion dimensional vectors. You're dealing with, you know, hundreds dimensional vectors. If you really want to, you can combine it with this lane dimensional vector and throw it in. But in reality, this ends up being as a very, very kind of salient representation, uh, which you can, you know, and which can then combine with your linear learner using this lane dimensional vectors. And then in terms of annuity, this is where it gets interesting because uh, as things churn through, uh, you have multiple ways to deal with the churn. Uh, so you can, for example, manage those tables effectively, depicting certain things, uh, adding other things. Uh, or you can have multiple tables more on that shortly. So, okay, so the question is, like, the tables get huge. Uh, how do you, like, what's the rule? How do you do it? Uh, and so this is where sketches come very handy. How many people are familiar with sketches? All right, uh, sketches is a fancy word for hashing uh, stored into tables. Uh, here, I'll give you a very great picture and we'll come out telling everyone how we know sketches. Uh, so basically, just like with hashing, you use a single hash function uh, to map things into buckets. Uh, sketches mean that instead of a single hash function, you're now using multiple hash functions, and you're mapping it into multiple buckets. And this has a really cool property. So this count min sketch is the, probably the most important sketch ever. 
Uh, and here's the idea. Um, so since all we're storing is counts, so when we're adding new things, we just have to, okay, well, what's the, we're going to add a count plus one for this current IP, because it was a clip, um, and we're going to need to add. So with normal hash, you would you would just say, okay, I'm going to either look up the bucket for that query or for that IP and add plus one. With hashes, you can do the following. So I'm going to have multiple rows, each of them is just a hash, and then they, well, there are different hash functions, they're going to map to different buckets. So you're basically going to add your plus one or plus you know, current count into each of those. Uh, and they're may collide. Some of them may collide, some of them may not collide. Uh, but the nice thing is that, well, as long as at least one of them did not collide, uh, when you do the lookup uh, for that value, you're going to look at all those buckets. And then hoping, hopefully, as long as at least some of them didn't collide, as long as you take them in, you'll recover the original value. Uh, so it's similar to this notion. So balloon filters are kind of a similar idea for just uh, checking whether something exists. Uh, but basically, you're getting this uh, error correction by repeating this. And so the way to think of it is like suppose you're storing counts for a, you know infrequent query, uh, and then if even the first the first function may function may may hurt you because it'll collide with some crazy frequent query, so that count will just be way overinflated. But that's okay, as long as at least one of these doesn't have a bad collision, so that means that you're still able to recover the breadth of the lower error. Uh, and again, it's obviously very simple to implement. I'm pretty sure that there's, a, like, there's probably multiple conditions in most popular systems, if not on every code that out there. And so what this allows you to do is that this allows you to basically have not worry about how you're going to deal with uh, certain things uh, becoming more popular or less popular. Uh, you can just say, okay, we're going to just sketch the whole thing. Uh, the counts are going to be imprecise, uh, but as long as you just you play with uh, what should be the depth, this is known as depth, this is known as width. Uh, so you can play either making it wider, or you can have play with width, making it deeper. So, yeah, deeper. Uh, so then. And that will basically, and there's uh, well-defined vertical results, uh, Graham Tremor did and Wintu, uh, did lots of work on that stuff, uh, including some very nice tutorials and so on. Uh, but this is arguably the, I don't know, the most important algorithm of the, you know, of the decade, I would say. Like, I'm by stuff, uh, since that right uh, But it's, it's nice and simple and it works great. Uh, so that's good. So, okay, so going back to what we want to do, uh, which is we want to do our counting. So what we can now do is start those tables. Uh, and in each of the tables, we can either use direct value lookup, we can use hashing, we can use sketches. It's really up to us. Uh, and if we start the file, we do basically count up all our big log and get all our information about all the IPs we've seen, all the queries we've seen, all that stuff. Uh, the nice thing is that this is truly doable on any memory system out there uh, or locally uh, because you're just aggregating it with going through and you know adding. Uh, and then in terms of bin function, so the nice thing is that also because unlike my base, you don't have to worry about well I'm going to store it for this property and that property, you can create combinations. So you can start storing it for combination of query and add or user and time of day or anything else you want. Uh, because unlike my base, you don't worry about the fact whether these things are independent or not. Like, they're going to be dependent, everything's going to be dependent. Uh, but that's why you're going to throw it into a nice, easy version next. Uh, and then another thing you can do also is that you don't have to have this one backup bucket. Uh, you can also start backing up. For some cases, the backup is natural. Like for IDs, uh, you can obviously start storing the counts for the first two bytes or the first byte. Uh, so even if, if you know the full thing doesn't have full counts, those backup values will actually give you kind of better estimates uh, just based on the backup. Um, so there's basically lots of room to play with. So then what you can do, like we said, any example gets featureized by uh, you look up the values, you look up the counts, you create this little quadruple, uh, and then you fill in those values from the lookup in there, and that's your feature vector. And so now what you can do is you can use that as a feature vector to train your, we call it combiner, uh, but basically the, your biggest boosted tree keep that Cool to do that you can throw at it uh, in your data elapsed. So that's where the nice thing is that you don't, and that's where you don't have to worry about whether you know they were independent or not. You're breaking all the rules of night base and so on because well, that's if your if your net if, if your big net is really all that uh, or your inclusive tree package is good, it should be able to figure it out uh, and not be bothered by the fact that obviously there's going to be crazy correlations between uh, multiple values. So that's nice.
nice. Uh, so basically, also, it doesn't mean that you don't filter out every everything one can have. Sure, you can try putting it in. You can have your linear system. Again, the practice uh, would seem like where a linear system just becomes another feature for this, uh, which adds another kind of useful estimator, which then the combiner just sort of samples together. Uh, so it's all pretty modular, and I'll keep you know, saying about how great the modularity is over and over. Um, so the, and then what you can do is, okay, so this is all training, so now you've got this big system trained, you've got your counts set up, you've got your, your combiner. Uh, so the cool thing is that the counts can just keep going. Uh, and so this is a pretty straightforward operation to set up, uh, because now as your new stuff comes in, all you're doing is you're now just updating those data continuously. Uh, unlike, so, and this is another important differentiator versus just like having a full learner train on every example and you know update the full model. You don't need to update the full model very often because all the full model learns to do is how to trade off the estimate based on the user with the estimate based on the query with the estimate based on the combination. So it's kind of just a, a net on something. Uh, and while these things will keep on changing, uh, the you know whether to trust the estimate from the ad if the user estimate is sort of flaky or something, that doesn't really change that much. Uh, so that basically decouples your continuous training in terms of updating the historical data that you see as just updating those probability tables from the retraining of the combiner, uh, which is sort of this meta thing that doesn't really need to change that much. Uh, and so this basically makes it a fairly easy setup for actually online learning, uh, because now you can keep going. And the major benefit of this setup in terms of production is that now you can, the, the tables are pretty easy to monitor. Uh, it's also pretty easy to debug. So if all of a sudden you know you have a bot attack and suddenly there is some cell here that just goes through the roof, it's pretty easy to tell that, well, how about I just like throw that cell out because it's full of garbage? That was put in their third day. Uh, or if I'm getting crazy predictions, I can go back and say, okay, what what for this crazy prediction? Uh, is that because the query prediction is saying something wacky? Like who is responsible? And you can basically resign the responsibility. So the difference with something very monolithic is that you know something's very monolithic. You can't. It's very hard to basically either assign blame to where that things come from, or to undo the damage done if you were training in true online mode and basically a bunch of bad data was put in. Uh, so that's what the fact that modularity becomes this really nice benefit of this. Okay, uh, so to be clear, so this is even though it's super popular in ads, uh, fraud, uh, and other domains, it actually keeps getting uh, continuously rediscovered. Uh, recently, like it's been, I guess it was a year ago, so like the features, uh, people at Kaggle have been uh, using it over and over. Uh, but again, if you start looking back, uh, so Yahoo has published it pretty heavily uh, in various topics, mostly the topics of ads. Uh, but even before Yahoo, there were folks who were doing, you know, true detection in the late 90s. Uh, they were saying that the count of connections uh, there were, for example, uh, really So the idea is that you can use it in a kind of nice, modular way. Uh, then again, the earliest uh, record was uh, all areas, people who were doing compiler branch prediction, uh, which was like a hot moving area of, again, neural networks uh, in the early 90s, uh, they, before they kind of became uh, popular for, for a while. Uh, they had this name of pattern tables for this, uh, and they did exactly the counts, in this case the counts were of how often is each branch uh, in the code in the popular state. Uh, so, Nobody claims credit, it's a good idea, uh, as a big reason. Um, okay, so one kind of interesting work on this is that, uh, can we, how do we do this kind of counting versus training? Uh, and so that's actually pretty important. So if you don't, you separate the data so that if your counts are linking into the predictive training, uh, you will get leakage. Uh, so at least for the first stage, it's pretty important to separate because otherwise you will end up with uh, very overconfident predictor that's also going to do very badly at runtime uh, if your predictor is really good. So, okay, so one option is that you can just hold out. So, if, what if you don't have that much data? Uh, it kind of pains you to separate the counting data from the trick combiner training data. Um, also, one trick uh, that I tried, I'll be honest, uh, is that, well, how about like we just use what we featureize in each example, uh, we will subtract the values from the count. Uh, that turned out to be a terrible idea uh, because you have both leakage and bias. Uh, the reason why uh, is because
because now imagine you have the two examples uh, that you would think to turn, but it just happens to be clipped once and not clipped another time. I mean, it's a noisy example, happens. So what will happen, though, is that now if you're doing this, what you thought was a nice, clever idea of holding out, you're effectively presenting this example as two different examples, and the way you're featurizing is actually encoding the label. Because now, when it was positive, you're going to subtract that positive from its positive count. Uh, when it was negative, you're going to subtract it from the negative count. Same example, this example becomes different, and you've basically just given the trainer a hint, oh, like, here is how you should train, if you, and it's pointing the other way from where it should go, because now it looks like uh, the guy that would be more negative or more positive is actually a negative, so you're completely straight up. Uh, so that's, uh, okay, so that thing doesn't work. Uh, so what turns out to work uh, is this trick from theory called differential privacy. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, the, 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 even the folks who were doing it, they had great ideas about privacy. It's still, I think, is a pretty hard to implement for privacy privacy, but it's great to implement for some domains like this as a regularizer. So formally, the way to think of it is that what the, the connection is that the privacy people think of basically preventing some sort of learner downstream from inferring stuff about stuff upstream. Well, the setup here is something that we basically have counts upstream and we want to prevent the learner, uh, even though the learner has to repeatedly look at the data upstream from being able to figure out the label uh, upstream. And so what if I'll skip the theory part, the important thing is what actually comes down to is you basically just have to randomize each count a little bit. Uh, I mean, that's duh, but you know, but these guys give us the reason why it's a good idea. Uh, so, and that randomization is actually giving you sort of the theory, theory plus way to not worry about the fact that you'll be leaking. Uh, because now, just by randomizing those counts a bit, you can reuse the same data over and over. So, that's that. Uh, okay, and then the other important part of this is that uh, time metric. So, one thing that's usually very helpful uh, with this scheme is that you want to keep your counts for different time periods. Because uh, with all these domains, you always want to know, well, if the user is, like, the reason is that things are bursty. Uh, users get into shopping mode, they click, 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 then they don't click for a while. Uh, so you don't want to just know what, like, what's their, you know, likelihood of click over, uh, or, like, if a certain IP is trying to, you know, so suddenly is taken over by a botnet, uh, is uh, trying to, you know, do all sorts of active nasty stuff. You don't care the fact that, that IP had a great history of the past year. You really want to know how that IP behaved in the past day. Um, and so that's why having counts that are time specific are very useful because they can always give you the recent signal versus the long-term signal. And a lot of the time, it's again, it's up to the combiner to figure out that sometimes you should just trust the recent signal no matter what the long-term signal says. Um, so that's great, but how do we actually do this? So the this is actually very important in all these domains uh, because they move fast. And the most basic thing is that, okay, we'll just have separate tables. Uh, we'll have a table you know, for the last month, for the last day, and we'll have some sort of scheme for rolling it over. Uh, well, that's kind of a mess because we do need to roll it over then every day to figure out how to basically combine a bunch of stuff. It also gets expensive because now we're multiplying our tables by a whole bunch, even uh, either setting up a whole aggregation process offline and reloading. Uh, but that's sort of a, it gets expensive. So it is, it's, it is reasonable though to at least start with that to see if the different time period is helpful because, you know, I know sometimes they may not. So there was a nice paper in the 2012 uh, by some, I think they were ex Yahoo at the time, and yeah, we have some really good Yahoo folks. Uh, so they had this idea, again, coming back to sketches, uh, they called the Focusai. Actually, I don't know that they small like Montreal or something. I don't know why they call it homicide, but they did for whatever reason. Uh, and the idea is that basically you allocate different size sketch tables to different time periods, and you make them smaller and smaller uh, on a long scale with exponentially bigger periods for longer periods. So it seems kind of obvious, well, but the longer term stuff, uh, you don't really care about the small values, but the small values really want the recent stuff. You, but the, it's OK to aggregate more crudely for long term. Uh, and the nice property of what they what they come up with is that the fact that these uh, go basically they, they kind of double in size they allow you to very easily roll over uh, because they can basically if you think of it the basic property of the sketch scheme is that because things 
cache into some buckets. Uh, if you now just say have the number of buckets, well, you can basically just add the counts from the buckets that you just folded over of itself. So this makes it fairly easy to manage. Uh, there are a few issues with it, though. I mean, it gets sharply discontinuous. So basically, at those boundaries of your you know, day, week long, and so on, you, you suddenly have this very sharp drop in precision. Uh, you still have to keep multiple tables, uh, and you do have this kind of hard events of, that, again, are pretty, pretty, pretty unrobust in terms of once in a while you just have this uh, sudden rollover and all of your count. You make different predictions all of a sudden for some of the data just because your counts have changed dramatically. So, uh, Anshamali, who was working with us, and he's now at Rice, and he had this really crazy and nice and simple idea of uh, actually Dolby noise reduction was the inspiration for this. So the way Dolby works uh, in a nutshell is that uh, in, when you're recording, you basically way emphasize the music frequencies, and this way the noise gets goes away. And when you are playing back, you basically de-emphasize or you apply the inverse of that. And that's that's Dolby nutshell. So here, effectively, we have the same idea. Uh, so what we can do is that now if we say we are hell-bent on having just one table for all time periods and not dealing with any of this, you know, multiple tables crap, uh, why don't we do the following? If we really care about the recent stuff, uh, what we're going to do is we make the recent stuff important. And then when we look up, uh, we also, when we look up per period, we then know that if we're looking up for, you know, long and way fast, uh, we have to deflate accordingly if we're looking for recent, we just edit it by adding by inflating it a tab, so we de-emphasize. Uh, so it's basically just a very simple algebra uh, that with time allows us to have this kind of recent versus not so recent stuff stored in the same table. Uh, it's all approximate, so if you're into that counts, uh, go back to the tables. Uh, but, the, but this actually does work pretty nicely in terms of being able to just manage it within a single table. So Formally, this means that yeah, you need to have a methodically increasing function as time goes by. You just keep giving more importance to or more weight to a recent step when you add it. And when you are looking up for either recent or not so recent, you just apply the corresponding uh, inverse of that uh, to actually rescale your time. So that works well. So here's a picture. Uh, so suppose, okay, so if no collision, uh, you, don't not, you don't really care because then you'll you know, multiply and divide. It works the same way. Uh, suppose you had some older stuff, some blue stuff sitting here, your new orange thing that get added. Uh, when you're looking up, uh, well, this is your collision problem, but now the older blue stuff has now inflated the amount you just observed. Uh, that, that's bad. So with adaptive, what you're doing is when you're adding a new orange thing, you're, you're you know, plus one, you suddenly are making it plus five, it becomes much bigger. So when you're looking up, uh, even though you're going to shrink the whole thing accordingly. So now the old thing got shrunk a lot more, so therefore the error is much smaller because your recent one dominates. Uh, so effectively you're allowing your recent additions to dominate, uh, and then your downscaling it to make it fall. So, okay, uh, there's, this is a pretty standard result for sort of count and sketch. Uh, I know they're very interesting saying that uh, we look up, we're going to do, uh, we're going to have some error, but we're going to hopefully have a bound of the error that's going to be a function of total number of things that you've added. Uh, that sounds really bad. Again, this goes back to the fact that you need to be careful about how big your table is. Uh, it's not bad in practice. Uh, it's okay. So in practice, what does need to happen, though, is that if you think about it, it's like this f of t keeps growing, growing, growing. So at some point, you're starting to add crazy high counts. So you do need to have periodically this uh, kind of, OK, let's uh, just de-emphasize everything and reset time. But that works pretty easily because then you basically just, if you just, as long as your function is monotonic, uh, you're just shrinking everything, your time gets reset, your lookups going back are still valid uh, because you just reset it with the time. So that's OK. And then in terms of functions, uh, we play with linear, we play with, uh, with, with, with exponential. Uh, there's a slight trade-off. Uh, I'll show you in a second. So, Okay, so this is kind of a messy graph. This is the same old Cortano data set. Uh, and then the one thing I didn't cover is the fact that you can do these like, so when you're hashing, you're now hashing with a specific time clock, but you can also do it for entire periods. Uh, in this, you get the same guys, uh, different paper, but they have this whole trick uh, of doing kind of this uh, time, time divided into logarithmic uh, scale buckets. So what the 
Israel. Uh, so Hoposide is uh, our recommendation of Hoposide, like all papers, uh, since we were trying to beat them, uh, it's entirely possible that we're from there. Uh, but I, I don't know, we, we, we think there's a, I think we think there's kind of an early issue there in terms of being really unstable in terms of the uh, Time flows to the right, uh, so most recent is uh, to the graph. And what this shows is that actually, so in the flat red is the fact that if you just didn't do any of this time modulation, you just use sketch over and over in order time. So what this allows you to do is basically have less error on recent stuff, uh, more error on far away stuff, but far away stuff usually doesn't matter as much anyway. Uh, and then if you're doing per long period uh, lookups, which is the case with all this kind of sketch scenario, then it's just fine because that's what that's like the, you, you care about the recent stuff. So just to wrap it up, uh, so linear bytes is a good idea because lots of folks have and draw and so on use it. It's easy to implement, it's just tables, counts, patches. Uh, most importantly for production, it's one it's horrible, one it's one it's horrible, debuggable, easy to track, uh, easy to recover from emergency, easy to debug. Uh, very modular so if you have a bunch of people working on a big complex system using a few points out of the computer model. Uh, or any, any other system, you can basically compose it nicely and track it. Uh, and then also the attack trick is easy to play with, uh, start the tables, use sketches. Thank you. 
your accounts produced for this game actually get going here. Uh, so whether how much effect that has on the downstream provider is essentially a separate issue. It's just that now you're saying like that the point here is that the features get noisier for longer periods that get less noisy for more recent periods. Uh, in recent applications where recency matters a lot, that's a good trade-off because then you're just getting better better estimates for the recent stuff. Uh, but it certainly could be the case that you know if you don't have that or if you're making it too noisy a bit more often than a lot of the value there, then you would hurt your net downstream accuracy because now you're serving those your features as well. Yeah, Everyone give it up for me, Seth, please.
apologize. Aria Haikani. That's awful. That was awful. I, uh, I'm a cultural anthropologist by training, and there was just nothing, nothing that represented my education there. Um, but Aria from Facebook, and he's going to talk all about content embedding. So please give it up for him. everyone, uh, thanks for coming out. Um, if you've ever seen me speak before, I do this thing where I ask for like a quick shoot up of hands when people are following stuff, and I, it's an important signal for me to kind of adapt how quickly I speak and what I say. So I'll ask everybody the same. So let's start with who follows that idea of, of putting their hands up? There we go. Okay, so I'm going to do it quite a bit. So you can do it. You don't have to expend too much effort. So today I'm going to talk about content embeddings at Facebook. Here's basically the outline of the talk. Um, I'm going to first give you some general background on embeddings. I'm going to tell you why they're important or why they've kind of become the new hotness. Um, and then I'm going to give you some basic applications. I'm in the wild production application and what they're doing for us. Um, and then I'm going to dive deeper into some of the math, right? And so I expect at this point to lose, uh, lose some people, but I think it's really important. I'm a big fan of kind of taking something simple and diving deep on it. And so we're actually going to spend a lot of time talking about work and back. I imagine most people have heard about that, but how many people feel like they can derive the algorithm for how to actually train the work back model? Okay, that what I expect. Was. So, embeddings, what are these things? Um, <laughs> an embedding is the idea of taking a discrete object and mapping it into a vector space. Uh, and the reason, so basically, you know, have some discrete space, I'm going to map into a real space. Um, and examples of the inputs are, are objects that you might work with in kind of consumer applications or in ads. Um, words, pictures, people, pages, post groups, etc. These are obviously Facebook specific examples, but you get the gist. Um, and they're, they're actually being used quite heavily throughout Facebook as well as elsewhere. Um, and the key property of an embedding is that they preserve similarity. So if intuitively you have the idea that X and Y are similar, um, and I'll get into what similar means, it's application specific. Um, what you want in that prop case is that the embedding that takes that to a real value vector space, you have a property that um, uh, that the uh, embedding under X and Y are similar or close together in that space. So it's kind of taking a intuitive notion of similarity, translating it into a kind of geometric one. So similarity is task specific and not universal. So why have these become so popular? Um, the first is that you get to generalize from discrete objects. So the motivating example for embeddings is word to But as I'll talk about, the concepts of embeddings actually go back way, way to the start of kind of computational linguistics and even um, into linguistics itself. Um, the vector space algorithms are something you can now use, right? So I took a problem about images and I made it into a bunch of vectors, and now I can apply a bunch of machinery that happens to be useful for vector space problems. The last is that they tend to be the building blocks for more complex models. So, you know, word to vec by itself is not a deep learning thing, right? It, it often gets lumped in together uh, by kind of over eager marketers, um, but it is in fact not a deep learning thing. But embeddings themselves obviously form kind of the basis or the first layer of a lot of interesting deep learning stuff. So, I'm going to first tell you a little bit about where the idea comes from. Um, so. First off, there's this thing called distributional semantics. Um, quick show of hands, who's heard of distributional semantics? OK. Distributional semantics is an idea that originates from linguistics, not from computer science or MIPS or AI or anything. <laughs> and so um, there was this linguist called J.R. Firth, one of these early pragmatist linguists. Right? Uh, these are people who are interested in um, the sociological usage of language effectively. And um, so the, a lot of the pragmatic uh, linguists were interested in in how it is that you can characterize the meaning of a word, not kind of in terms of abstract lambda calculus, which is what was historically used, but instead by the context in which we use something. So Sir Firth had said, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. Um, and then, of course, there's, there's uh, Ludwig Wittgenstein. Um, we think you'd be seeing Wittgenstein in a talk today, but you're wrong. Um, <laughs> uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, he was famous for kind of these bold pronouncements, but here's, uh, here's another one of them. And we translate to English, of course, from German. Uh, the meaning of a word is its use, um, ever the modest person Wittgenstein was. Um, so what does this idea actually mean in terms of an operation? What does it actually mean, right? The idea is that Barbie Bach, what does this word mean? Who knows what this word means? Ah, oh, that was a chess, it's a made up word. I'd actually trick people on that word. Uh, 
It's, it's a catch of pretentious people. Um, <laughs> Um, he handed her the glass of Barney Whack. These dishes are, uh, are complimented by Barney Whack. Um, Nigel staggered home drunk on Barney Whack. I only karaoke after a lot of Barney Whack. Okay, so um, now who gets a sense of what Barney Whack means? Okay, so you just, you just proved Firth and Wittgenstein correct. Okay, so um, what does this have to do with uh, natural language processing and, and embeddings in general? Um, well, the idea is that this concept, this intuition that you can look at all the words surrounding something and, and try to characterize its meaning, it becomes oper operationalized as follows. Um, so, you know, we jumped from kind of that example to saying, Bill, we can make a sparse co-occurrence matrix where each word is a row, and the columns represent normalized vector, uh, normalized context counts. So here you've got um, a bunch of sentences, each row is a word, and the columns are the context words, and you can, you can derive this matrix. This is actually some of the earliest tricks in computational linguistics, right? You can look at papers from like, depending on how far back one characterizes it, the, the mid to late 70s. Um, but this is very popular, being done for a long time, and in a very crucial way, you can actually show it's not that different than what Wurtzbeck is doing with this crucial thing about PMI at all. That you talk about later. Um, but so this was an idea. People took these matrices, they ran uh, various factorizations or dimensionality reductions, like SVGs on them, and they were used within NLP for a long time, long before kind of uh, long before even the original advent of neural networks. Okay, this is the instantiation of this idea that you're used to say. What you're used to hearing about is work back and its many derivatives and and uh, variants, and the key difference between them is I just showed you where we were counting words in the context, and words of X is basically predicting them, and that's the, that's the big difference. Um, so words of X. So what does this thing do? I'm just, just I'm sure I'm gonna look at 80%. How many people have heard of it? Okay, but then, okay, got it, perfect. So I'll, I'll go over this a little more quickly. Um, so the basic idea is that I'm gonna think about all the sentences I see, as a bag of a target word and a bunch of context words, right? So if I have the quick box, that's going to basically look like um, that's going to basically look like this. Quick show of hands uh, to whom does this make sense? Cool. All right. So um, now now we're going to get a little more mathy. Um, the way that this actually works, you normally when you characterize an algorithm, you talk about what the parameters are and what the objective is. So here um, I'm going to talk about each target word being itself, uh, getting its own little vector embedded that we're going to learn. So these are parameters that we learned. Um, and each context word, which is some word that appears in some context, is going to get its own um, get it, getting its own parameters. And so notice that a given word may have kind of two representations. It might have a theta w for that word when it's the target, and it will also be um, the theta context, assuming it gets sampled as a context word. Okay? Um, oh, I had a point about that. I didn't say it. Uh, yeah, you end up with two representations. In practice, what happens is uh, um, you can either average them or just use one. Exactly. That's just something to know. Okay. So rather than counting the words like you just saw when we we're talking about this distributional semantics thing that has this word in the of linguistic thinking, um, instead build a model to predict each context word from the target. Right. So this is a little bit different. So before when we talked about, uh, we, were, we were looking at a target word and counting the context words. Here what we're gonna actually do is, is somewhat the reverse. Um, we're actually gonna predict the context word given the target word. Now if you know word the deck, you know that there's this other crazy thing called continuous bag of words that's also used and that's fine. This is just for the purpose of simplicity, I'm cutting that out. We're just talking about script error models. So here the idea is, um, I don't want to just count this thing. A good way of representing the meaning of a word is a model which can predict the context word. And so the particular mechanism by which that's going to happen, and I'm going to explain where this comes from because this should be godly. Um, so actually, quick, quick show of hands. Who thinks they figure, they understand what this means and is doing? Okay, I'm going to ask that in another slide or two, and I, I want to see the CDF go up. Um, so, okay, so here's what this is, and I'll, I'll work through what this means. So basically, um, uh, this here is going to be the dot product between the word and the context vector, okay? And um, you're going to exponentiate and then you're going to normalize in the standard way. You're going to sum over everything. Okay, now just as a statement of mathematical definition to understand what's going on. Okay, but not why the hell am I doing this? Okay, good. 
So um, some fancy notation. So this is actually pretty useful. So it's often easier to think about proportionality. So um, here what I'm going to do is I'm going to say that the probability of given context given the target word is proportional to um, the exponentiated thought product between those, the context and the word vector. Um, and I'm going to omit the denominator because the denominator is just a normalizing factor. Okay. And then this. Um, and then I'm actually going to go even further. I'm going to think about log proportionality. Um, log proportionality is the thing that I wish I had learned when I first learned about log linear models as a way to think about them. But um, this fancy little L there means that I have log proportional, meaning if I exponentiate, um, if I exponentiate the right hand side, I'm proportional to it. So that's actually really, if you ever are in the need of writing notation for log linear models, it's a lot easier to think of this way. Okay, so what I'm saying here is that the bigger that your dot product is relative, uh, the bigger the dot product is between these two words, the bigger the log probability is, right? Because again, this is log proportional. Um, and so um, the bigger your log probability is, the bigger your probability is because of <coughs> the magic of our Okay. Uh, <laughs> so um, just a quick reminder from vector algebra, what does that actually mean? Well, it means that um, the dot product is report, okay, so, who remembers what a dot product is? Do I need to actually do this slide? Okay, I'm going to skip it. Basically, just remember uh, the dot product being big means that uh, the, assuming the vectors are normalized, it means the angle between them is small. So it's coming back here. Um, I'm going to independently predict each contact from each top target word. And I'm going to choose an embedding that puts target word vectors in the same direction as associated contacts. So again, uh, remember that because the context, predicting the context given the word is log proportional to that, Maximizing the log probability means that I have the uh, I have on average a context and a word vector are close together. So this is a statement of the property. You know, objective functions are always weird. Here's the thing I always tell students is um, the purpose of an objective function is to define a relationship between the parameters and the objective that has this intuitive property. The intuitive property is that I want to learn embeddings that have a property that if I see a, a context and a target word together a lot, I want those vector representations to be close together. Who follows that statement of operational intuition? Okay. Uh, quick question from someone who doesn't understand. Anyone there? Some people didn't raise your hand. Are you just being lazy? Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, basically, that's the statement of operational intuition. This mathematical formula means that when I make this thing big, I make this thing big, which means I make this thing big, which means I have the, the vectors close together. Okay. So that ends the first math part. Okay. The second math part's a little more complicated, but that ends the first math part. Um, now, if you if you kind of dropped out because things got a little technical, you can come back in because I'm gonna I'm gonna basically go over uh, applications. Um, so, first I'll talk a little bit about content. All these examples come from content search and discovery, which is where most of my teams are, is in content search and discovery. Um, these are basically doing things, uh, looking at search again from a mobile first perspective, and, and in particular, things that are aware of you or your network. So things like, what do my friends think about strange things? You know, aggregate that sentiment, tell me how many friends liked it, how many friends of friends didn't like it, etc. cetera. Um, where, what hotel should I stay in in Paris because I have tons of friends and friends of friends who have gone to Paris and stayed at various places and maybe there's interesting information there. Um, I want to see photos from all my friends' weddings and my friends' posts about their weddings don't actually say wedding. Um, they're usually pictures from a wedding. Uh, so there's a lot of these interesting issues in content discovery and search. Um, all these examples come from there. Okay, um, so the first is post search. So post search is exactly what it sounds like. We have over 2.5 trillion posts um, on Facebook and uh, we want to be able to search over that. And what does that mean? Um, well, that actually means searching over conversational uh, style documents. So the sense in which it's different than web search is that um, people don't tend to use, you know, you, we rely a lot on the fact that web documents tend to have a lot of words, big labels they can use, and et cetera. And so posts have very little. And so um, when we're often searching for things, you know, we're searching, you know, I might have re uh, remembered that my friend Robot, he was talking about bird watching. Our recollection of what a post is about has a lot more context than just the actual text of the post itself, right? Um, and so uh, this is this is something that's a little challenging. It's, it's, it's got a little more of a kind of, you can call it a pure expansion flavor if you want, compared to normal document search. So there's lots of ways to solve these kind of problems, and, and people have worked at this up for years. But we've actually gone with uh, post embeddings, and 
Um, they appear to be working pretty well. So here's how that works. Um, basically, it's this idea that rather than have a word vector and a context vector, um, I instead am going to have to project um, queries and, and posts into the same space. Okay, I'm going to talk about how I'm going to put them into the same space. And the property that I want, not, not that different from the embedding property we spoke about just a moment ago, um, is that if I were to have said Rohan Autobahn or Rohan bird watching, those queries are going to be close together because those are similar seeming things. Um, and then I also want the post to be embedded in this place close to those, so I'm able to retrieve it um, and rank um, according to the kind of slightly different query. And again, I wouldn't actually recommend this for global web document search. If you made me build a work web search and kind of track, I would not do this early. This is primarily because these are kind of conversational style documents. Um, so uh, that's the idea. Oh, geez, my animation's busted. Okay. Um, so uh, here's what this actually looks like. This is actually done by uh, an intern this summer, actually. Uh, it's pretty phenomenal. It's not yet in production. It's getting there. It's got some fun stuff. But, um, so this is actually done by an intern. Uh, and basically, the, the, uh, the idea, and this is going to get a little geekier, the idea is that um, we have these fixed query embeddings, and then we also have uh, post embeddings. Um, um, these are trained with some convolutional layers. It doesn't matter what those are. Basically, at the end of the day, you learn a specific embedding for the post, you've got a query embedding, um, and then you're building a simple model to predict whether or not that pair has the relational property that there was a click, uh, there was a click on that post for that query. Right? So, so I'm telling you what it means for the query to be like the post is that the, the, the pair has a, has a click between them. Okay. Um, you can choose other objectives. Actually, C pair is not necessarily the best one. In fact, we have lots of cases in which it's not, but this is what we did here. Um, and what I'm saying is I want to learn an embedding that has a property that it puts queries and posts which have been clicked on in a search together similar in the same space. Okay. So this is a, this is like a, a different, this is different than word effect, but the concept is basically, is very similar. Um, okay. Photo and video search. So this is this is this is uh, obviously Facebook's got a lot of photos, got a lot of videos. Um, so uh, this is basically um, find photos and videos from your friends in the world. Um, obviously, like you can have text from photos in various ways, but um, um, oftentimes we're actually interested in searching the content itself, i.e., the photo itself. Um, so embeddings have been proven to work uh, very well in settings where the feature design is hard, like images. Um, so this is not a text example. So we're getting even further away from word bank example. This is um, I want to actually learn. Uh, uh, I want to actually learn how to search an image itself. So this is this example to be a little more complicated. So this is actually going to be um, something called a two-stream query embed. So um, this is this is going to be a little abstruse, but I'll, uh, I'll try to explain it well. So last time we saw, I had a, I had a stream for the query. I had a little channel for the query and a post. And I said I want to build a model that predicts that they click. So it turns out, for a variety of reasons, um, with photos in particular, you don't just want to learn that, but you want to learn to directly compare um, two images together for a given query and say which is better. Right? So this is like a quote unquote pairwise uh, ranking issue rather than an absolute one. And it turns out for images, it's pretty important for reasons that I can't get into because it's a little complicated. But here's just another example. So here, um, I've got an embedding for a query, not unlike the one that we had before. And it turns out I'm going to share parameters of that query here, and then I also have an image. And what I'm going to do um, is uh, look at the, uh, what I'm going to do is actually uh, look at the cosine angle between the embedding for both of these things. And I'm going to know ahead of time for a given query, I'm going to know ahead of time that which image was good, the positive one, and which image was bad. And what I'm going to say is I'm going to train a model at the very top to say, learn embeddings for images that have a property that for a given query, we know that one of those images was a better result than the other. Um, and so you're going to end up with a slightly more complicated network here, where um, you, at the end, the top level thing is the ranking loss between the cosine here. And so basically, the property that you want is that um, you want a larger cosine, i.e., a smaller angle uh, between the good image and the query embedding versus the bad one. Right? And crucially, this query, these query parameters are shared because it's the same query. You're, you're comparing two images on the same query, basically. Okay. Um, so, uh, so this is actually this is actually this actually works. It's not just a you know thing. I, obviously, I can be very careful about what I can say in terms of numbers, but here's what I can tell you. Um, 
So uh, a simple joint model, so we, we trained a version of this which was just basically one side of this, or actually this side of it, right? So the equivalent of the post example would have been, ignore everything here, I've got a query and an image, and the user either clicked on this or didn't, and you could train a model like that, okay? We're gonna call that our baseline, and then we trained a model which was basically this four uh, this two string kind of thing, which is don't just try to predict whether or not you get a click or don't get a click, learn to directly compare two images for given query, and you get a 5% uh, uh, length in the rock, which is pretty important for a class like this. It's a pretty useful one. Okay, okay. Um, last example, uh, new search and discovery. So um, this is kind of exactly what it sounds like. Um, a lot of people get their, their news from Facebook. Um, most people in America. <laughs> so, uh, so uh, the t and search is actually still a large part of the news in general. Um, so to detect that a query has news intent and retrieve the most relevant news results. Right? So that's what we're interested in here. There's another part of this which is related to kind of, um, you know, Facebook in general is a push news out of the pull news platform. So there's pull here, but there's also push. So detect when a news event is breaking um, and notify people about these events, right? So this is kind of the, you know, in some sense we, we've got, a, we know a lot about stories that are being shared and philosophies, et cetera. So it seems like an actual one here. Okay, so here's an example from that space. So there's a lot of problems here in document events, understanding and summarization. So this is more kind of like traditional web search in some way. Um, so this is this is the problem of how do I predict a good domain for a query? Um, so uh, here I've got an example. Uh, I've got a couple different queries. So these are all come from the video game world. Um, so if I search for Counter Strike, um, it may be that the New York Times does have an article about Counter Strike that is recent, but it turns out. The PC Gamer is actually probably a better topical authority source for that than the New York Times, even though the absolute popularity or any way that you want to define global creative and authoritativeness um, would come from the New York Times. PC Gamer is probably better for this particular query. Um, and the nice thing is there's lots of ways to boil that down. Um, so here what we're doing is we're learning to directly from pairs where um, a user typed a query and they clicked on a particular article URL and there was some domain there. Um, and so, what we're at, where people actually dwell, so that's crucial. So, think, unlike some other things here, this isn't trying to maximize CTR, but actual article dwell, um, which is how we get around quickly. Um, so, uh, this is learn to pre prefer topical learnings for a good query. And this is really important because you have a lot of different niche topics being searched about, you know, when you, when you have Facebook search scale. Um, and so, you want to actually, uh, you don't want to just serve up the top couple thousand domains for, for news in general. You want to get long tail into this kind of stuff. Um, so if I do a general video game query, um, Kutaku is a pretty popular site for that. If I search about Halo, um, there's all these kind of Xboxy sites in particular that are good for that. And so this is this is really important. It's actually, if you look at the previous talk, some of the relations. So you know, um, you know, one way to deal with like large, large sparse data is kind of sketches, which is which is pretty popular. Another way is actually training up embedding for them and using those kind of features. And probably the right answer is to do both of them, as it turns out, the right thing to do is option to learn. Um, so this is kind of another example. Again, this is actually identical to word effect, except that I replaced words in context with query and domains, right? There's some details here, like I'm fixing the query embedding or initializing it from the previously trained model, but conceptually, it's actually just the same as word effect. It's just being applied different ways. I've heard that Spotify actually does a model like this for predicting related artists, right? So they do, I have a playlist, and every time I have two artists in a playlist, that's a, that's a cool occurrence. And so now I, I learned that I learned an embedding over artists, which has the property that artists in the same place are supposed to gather and all the whole back of the way to the small. Okay. We have time. Seven minutes. Perfect. Okay, back to math. <laughs> okay, so this is gonna be more math, right? And so um, I may try to speed through it a little bit in order to save time for questions. Um, but this is actually going back deeper than that. Because I actually think it's really important to understand. Like, I think it's really important to understand understand what's going on with these things because your intuitional muscle is the most important tool in machine learning. And it's better to have a thing that you actually understand than to throw stuff into a black box. Unfortunately, the culture of machine learning is basically let me make a hack on these posts about some complicated thing and I have no idea how it works and hope for the best and trust everyone. Um, and that maybe works well if you're kind of like raising a bunch of money. Uh, but it turns out not to work well for actually making it work. Um, <laughs> so let, let's see that. So how demanding are some of these computations that we saw? So earlier, um, we talked about doing this computation, which is, was all well and fine. 
Um, however, the problem is this is a sum over an entire vocabulary, right? This could be in the case of queries. So you know, if you saw examples from these for queries, right? This is millions, right? Or these are uh, and you know, words you might go, okay, maybe there's a couple hundred thousand just of bad we found here in some cases here. So this obviously doesn't work on top of this. Okay. I'm going to talk about an idea called noise contrasted estimation. Who's heard of that? Okay, perfect. <laughs> this slide won't be wasted. Um, so the setup is as follows. Um, suppose you have a distribution that's hard to normalize, but which it's easy to compute the numerator. Right? And this is basically every distribution of machine learning that you want. Um, so basically, I'm going to say every distribution of machine learning in like a long linear style model or many others has this property that it's got a numerator, which is pretty easy to compute um, for a given input, and it's got this set of data, which is this big thing that doesn't depend on the input. Right? This is the left side is proportional to the right hand side numerator. Okay. So here's the idea. It's really hard to directly learn the parameters for these kind of models because you have to sum up the denominator. Instead, solve a slightly easier problem, and that easier problem will converge to the uh, this easier problem will converge to the answer for the problem we're trying to solve under some conditions. So take k samples from some random noise distribution, um, and then pick one true sample from the distribution you're trying to actually learn the parameters for. Okay, and now you have k plus one elements. Um, try to choose one element amongst them at random. So here, this is what this represents. Um, this is this is the probability of choosing uh, of what the sample looks like from this above process. One over k plus one times you get the true sample that you're actually trying to go for, and k out of k plus one times you pick a sample from this noise distribution. Uh, quick show of hands, who's following? Perfect. Okay. Um, so instead of estimating p of w directly. Instead, estimate the, the binomial problem of did my sample come from this side or did my sample come from this side? Okay, so instead of actually trying to predict the parameters for this model directly, instead set it up so that you're going to pick some fixed sample size k, and instead your job is to predict is this noise or is this real? Okay. And it's going to turn out that as. Um, as you make k larger and larger, it actually turns out to be the same as the, the same. And it's kind of obvious to see that, right? Because if you tell me I'm going to pick, if I picked k to be the size of the vocabulary minus 1, this is basically the same thing as predicting the probability of the element of the distribution. That last part might be a little fuzzy, but it basically turns out to be the same problem. OK, so let the random variable d be 1 when the sample comes from the true distribution and 0 otherwise. Right? And so now you have this. Um, the probability that d equals 1. Uh, given w is equal to this. This is just the definition of conditional probability. And then here, what I've done is I've substituted the fact that if d equals one, and this is a this is a true sample of w, then the probability of that is just the probability under this true distribution you're trying to sample from. And otherwise, p of w it turns out is uh, p of w plus this, right? And follow? There's a k. There's a k plus one that canceled out. Okay. So now what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to find a way to encourage the partition function to be nearly one and assume it away. Okay. So this is actually called something called local normalization or some variant of it. It turns out the way that you actually make your updates and how you can encourage the, the partition function to be close to one. Right? In fact, most of the algorithms will do this. Um, so basically, this is a little hand wavy, and I can go through the details if someone wants. Basically, what you assume is that z of theta is close to one, either by some by the way the inference algorithm works or some other construction, or by normalizing normalizing each individual vector. Um, and so now what you have is you take that last slide and you basically just assume that z of theta is is uh, one, and basically you get this. Who's following, assuming that I just magically assume z of theta is one? Okay, let me show the last slide one more time. So. Um, here, so we, we ended up here. This guy is basically U of, U of W with a Z term. And on the next slide, basically, I said, no, nope, that's one. Um, okay. So now I'm going to treat the noise distribution as uniform over a set of samples. So basically, what that means is that, that Q W is, is 1 over K. And so now um, I had k times q of w, and I'm going to say q of w is just uniform amongst these samples. So 1 over k, and so you end up with a plus 1 over there. 
Okay, and so now you have, in the particular case of words of that, you just have u of this, blah, 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 which is sigmoid of the dot product, which is where you have end up with that. Okay, he's following for a quick second. That's good. Um, so now, I basically have taken the problem of estimating a big multinomial distribution, and instead I'm going to estimate by binary classification. Did this sample come from a true sample, or did it come from like this fake distribution? OK, and so what that ends up looking like is um, what I'm going to do is make some fake samples. Um, I'm going to fake, I'm going to get some fake samples C prime, and I'm going to estimate P of D equals 0, and I'm going to have my true example of W and C. And so again, if I were to take this and let K be really large and expand all this map out, what you just saw is that it's actually the same thing as predicting the uh, entire thing. Okay, um, C is a nice sample. And then, voila, you end up here. And at this point, this is just numerical optimization. At this point, it's just now you can plug it into. It's interesting. People think of TensorFlow as being a deep learning specific thing. It's just a way of setting up kind of math problem computations on automatic derivatives. As soon as you can do that, like in, in today's world, um, it's basically the same as solving it. So this is differentiable, right? So I can take derivatives here pretty easily. Or if you can't do it, TensorFlow can do it for you, uh, or Pat too. Um, and then uh, in summary, I talked about why these things matter. I gave you three examples of Facebook, and I gave you kind of a derivation of a longer table. Questions? First round of applause. All right, um, we have time for the C3 and the C3 we'll go for that. Any questions for the audience? Everyone's good. Yes, over here. Anyone else? We're back. It's not an option. It's not an option. It's straight up a C3, so it's not. Three, three. Anyone else? Going once. You will not have another option. We'll come to the record. Oh. Okay. oh. Not too much. No, it's all right. Not much. All right, so then. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I was just wondering if you could talk about the, what you do for a little bit. Um, yeah, so there's, there's, so there's, a, there's a couple answers. So um, the general answer and there's a word that answer. Like, okay. So the general answer is typically in neural networks, what people will sometimes do is they will add a term to penalize, uh, penalize the result when it deviates from one. That's, that's one common answer. Um, the other answer is that you can actually um, normalize all the, just normalize the potential at once. Um, this is something with local normalization, and it turns out to actually work quite well. In fact, I think it's actually been proved how it works. I'll, I'll dig up in Jacob Andreas' paper um, that actually goes through why it's a trick that tends to work in general. Um, but yeah, there, those are the two answers. Right here. Uh, hello, and thank you for all the and such. Um, I, I'm curious, uh, I'm not to the linguistic side, but the sociolinguistic aspect of uh, pragmatic and so forth, and measuring the context of the reality and, and all kinds of different ways, uh, kind of to discern meaning and so forth. And in different languages outside of, of English, it's So 
okay. Um, no, these are offline rated. So the problem with photo books and photo books are pretty ugly in particular because like there's this phenomenon of distractibility or presentation bias. Um, and so like photo books in particular are hard to learn from online data. These are from offline, these are offline rating um, and so they're the better practice. Now you can probably make online photo clips work. It's just that we notice it's got, I mean, we can measure this, right? If you randomize your result and measure, you can measure quick, quick bias in the first position, obviously. And photos in particular are quite strong from this. People just click on photos regardless of the relationship with the period sometimes. And, and document, like documents and posts have this property too, just a lot less so, right? You can measure the, the clicking also stuff just by randomizing. And photos are like, photos and videos are by far the worst in this respect. Then we have time for maybe two more. Anyone? Anyone? Yes. Right. Can you just shout it? I don't want to run across everybody. It's going to be weird. Okay. Lara? Right. Uh, you briefly mentioned something about um, the technique of Last chance anyone? 